My guest, or I should say our guest in this next segment, Seth DiStefano, West Virginia Center of Budget and Policy. Seth, good morning to you, sir. How are you feeling today? Doing pretty good, Rob. Thanks for having me back on. Great to have you on again. I, I, I know, you know, uh, Matt, when he was talking about organized crime, looked right at me because my name ends in a vowel. Yours does too, <laughs> Seth. Just so everybody knows, you and I are completely clean and clear of all charges. And and not coordinating together, just <laughs> FYI, for, for, just so Matt knows. That's uh, correct. You know, you know. No conspiracy. We've never been in the same room together. The RICO statutes do not apply here. Yeah, you know, I read a fascinating thing about the RICO statutes, right? So they were brought around uh, about 50 years ago or so and signed into law by Richard Nixon. And the first use of the RICO statute was actually used in the Watergate scandal and helped force Richard Nixon out of office. I don't know if people are aware of that or not. That's just something I was reading about the RICO statutes in a book I was reading years ago, and I found that to be a bit ironic. Uh, Seth, let's talk about West Virginia's tax cut, and this, uh, I presume, by the end of this session is going to become law. This was a negotiation between the House and the Senate that involves, among other things, a 21 and a quarter percent state income tax cut, a rebate on personal property. Uh, there's some stuff in there for veterans as well. And uh, some other things also that are part of this, uh, what adds up to 700 and almost $60 million in tax cuts for West Virginians. And my understanding is it uh, awaits just the House signature and then the governor's before it becomes law. Your comments on this, sir, because it is not the full out 50 percent tax cut that the governor wanted and that you opposed. Uh, well, so, you know, once again, it's, it's just more of the same, right? Um, when you analyze uh, both bills that the state Senate has sent the House, right? So um, just as kind of a background for the listeners out there, um, within the first week of the legislature, uh, the House of Delegates sent a 50 percent personal income tax cut um, to the Senate. The Senate didn't do anything with that bill in the short term. Instead, what they did was they sent Senate Bill 424, um, which was kind of a hodgepodge of, of kind of tax breaks um, for, for well, you know, well-to-do businesses um, and a 15 percent personal income tax cut. Um, it's, you know, there's been a lot of almost like, you know, leadership figures trying to speak things into existence about like a grand bargain or a grand deal. But I'm a little bit skeptical because when when the Senate took up the, the, the bill that the House sent them, right, um, they completely amended it all. They, they took it all out and basically sent the same version of their original bill um, back to the House. Right. And so when when I think about compromise, I, I think about significant changes um, and I didn't really see any significant changes in what the Senate has has sent back to the House. Number one, um, you know, what you have are, once again, um, tax breaks that are overwhelmingly slighted to the wealthiest households, um, you know, uh, out of every every three dollars of the personal income tax cut, two of those dollars go to the wealthiest 20 percent of households in West Virginia. Um, and then you have several. Um, you know, business, personal property, equipment, machinery, tax rebate, if you will, um, that were pretty much the same thing voters rejected um, when they voted down Amendment 2. So I don't know how much, I don't know how much of a deal has actually been really actually struck. Um, and then with the governor introducing um, or, or sending a new revenue estimate um, to the legislature yesterday, um, just stumbling upon an extra $850 million dollars, um, you know, I'm not sure that we're any closer to the finish line uh, than we were six weeks ago. Seth, you mentioned that in, his, in a text last night. You were the first person to alert me of that. So do you know any details about where he found the $800-plus million plus and how we arrived at this figure as uh, kind of found money? Um, no, I, there have been no comments that I am aware of. Um, I know that um, you know during the House Finance Committee meeting yesterday when the House was taking up their version of the state budget, um, a delegate did ask for a representative for the governor's office uh, to come forward and explain, hey, how did you find $850 million extra dollars um, within the last seven weeks? Um, and no one from the governor's office uh, was available at that time to, to speak to. Him. So. It worries me about our accounting procedures that we just kind of found 800 something million that we didn't know was there. I hope it's not as simple as that. You know, Did anybody check the couch cushions when the governor got up? What do we got yeah. down there? You know, Matt Harvey. Right. <clears throat> good morning, Seth. Um, good to talk to you. 
Um, can you explain, just so everyone's clear, can you explain the process of adjusting revenue? Does that apply to the current uh, tax year that we're in now or, or budget year that we're in now, or does it apply to the future for the the House and the Senate to, to work some numbers? So I think what the governor sent yesterday, when the governor sent the, the, you know, that paper upstairs, that that is what he's speaking to is the fiscal year ahead, the one that, you know, the, the budget that um, the legislature is working on now, um, which applies July 1 of this year to June 30th of next year. So the, the 800 something million applies to next year? Yeah. So like, um, you know, the, the, the revenue estimate the governor sent up on January 11th um, was to guide um, the state budget that the legislature is working on for the next fiscal year, right? Um, the governor just decided that we will now have $850 million more dollars um, for that budget moving yesterday. Gotcha. Um, and the governor has sole power over the revenue estimate process, um, if, if, if you want to even call it a process. So does that ultimately zero out the tax cut? I mean... It certainly is um, a little bit convenient um, to, uh, to to come in and kind of do it this way. You know, if, if I had to guess, I would I would propose that the governor's office is trying to um, give members of the legislature a false sense of security um, that West Virginia can can somehow afford um, to hand out money um, to the wealthiest households and businesses in the state um, without decimating our ability to provide critical services, things that our people need, right? Um, you will never fix, you know, locality pay um, by handing hundreds of millions of dollars out the door, right? You won't fix PEIA. Uh, I was just having a conversation with some folks yesterday um, about the, the frustration that when it comes to things like child care, uh, when it comes to, you know, small investments in our communities that, you know, the state legislature could help with, um, the answer always seems to be, guys, always, we don't have enough money, right? But when it comes to a tax break, um, that overwhelmingly benefits the richest households and the wealthiest businesses in the state, all of a sudden we can find $850 million just out of thin air to make it happen. That's not good policy. Matt Miller. The governor is good at finding money, because I remember during the teacher strike and, and all of those elements of that first teacher pay raise, he was here in the Eastern Panhandle. We covered his being here at Spring Mills High School, where he swore there was just no way, and I woke up the next morning, and they had found money, and it was going to happen. So he's good at finding money. If you ever lose any, call, because he's got a way to find it, apparently. Um, anyway, I, love, I, I, love, I was just I love that you bring that up because it, it really brings in the intersection um, of politics and what we're talking about. Here. I remember that. I remember when the governor went out on the road. I think he went to Wheeling first and then he came out and visited the panhandle and did not get the warm and fuzzy reception he was hoping for. And then, like, just like you said, all all of a sudden the next morning, hey, we got 50 million dollars. I didn't I didn't realize we had this line around. Let's do the pay rate. So. Well, but, but what's getting lost in the shuffle here over the years is that he was correct. <laughs> we, we did have the money for the pay raise because we passed the pay raise. We didn't raise taxes to cover the pay raise. He's not the only, gov he's not the only governor to do that either, to, to right? adjust the revenues. So, and, and, and as we've gone forward with these surpluses, and they've backfilled the budget for PEIA and, and for some other items, the, the, the surpluses continue, and we're, we're now over a billion for this year, and they're saying maybe $1.7 billion by the end of this year, Seth, yeah. and the governor's now saying nearly another billion extra that he's found for next year, which might even be on top of surpluses that are going to roll in in 2024. Yeah, I mean, when you have the worst foster care crisis in the country. Mm -hmm. You don't have surf you don't have surplus, Rob. When you have a staffing crisis in your regional jail system that literally has a, a, a federal lawsuit, you know, focusing on, on one of our regional jails that we know of because staffing shortages are so bad because we can't pay anybody. Um, you in fact do not have surplus, right? West Virginia would do a lot better um, with these dollars if the governor truly believes we do have them. Um, in investing in our, our, you know, the ability um, of our people to have what they need and have things that are, you know, run competently and, and done well. 
Well, I, just, I, I get what know. you're saying, Seth. I mean, you know, if if the hole in the roof is there and every time it rains, the house gets wet on the inside, you don't really have money in your savings account, do you? You, you know, you need to use that money in the savings account to fix the roof. But the fact of the matter is the money is in the savings account and it could fix the roof. It's just a matter of the priorities that the legislature has in terms of how they want to spend what is a budget surplus. There, there is There is surplus money there. It, it could be used to fix foster care and roads or... It could be used to fix some of those things and give some money back to the taxpayers. This is what I mean, I think, the options right, well, I, are. You know, I can't, I can't disagree with um, you know, the, the way that you hit the nail on the head there, right? It is about priority. Um, and as we kind of get into the crunch time of the last 10 days of the legislature, I really think it's important for listeners out there to, to tell your members of the legislature you know, what they need to prioritize. Um, you know, whether it's you know, the things that are important to you. I heard, uh, I believe it was J.B., I caught the last tail end of his interview, um, and I think he, he brought up affordable child care, if I'm not mistaken, right? Like that. Yes. That's an important thing out there, right? That's something we could be investing in right now. Uh, but as I said before, when, when folks have come down to the legislature repeatedly over the last several years and said, hey, we could really use some help with affordable child care. It gets more people into the workforce. It's, it's good all around. The legislature and the governor never seem to have the money to do that. When it comes to this seven-year quest to try and enact tax breaks that really overwhelmingly benefit the wealthiest households in the state and the wealthiest businesses, um, which, you know, that, that second part does kind of thumb its nose at the voters of West Virginia because they clearly said no to those types of things, right? Um, $850 million appears out of thin air seven weeks after, you know, the original revenue estimate. So. You know, I think I think lawmakers have every right um, to be skeptical um, and, and should be asking hard questions. Matt Miller, not just of their leadership, but also of the governor's office as well. Seth, you mentioned earlier, you know, a, a need to have a fix for the the PEIA, and and we would never fix locality pay and so forth in in giving back too much money, and we we've got the money there to try to handle these things. Where, where do you, where does your organization kind of fall on locality pay, which is a huge issue here in the Eastern Panhandle? I, I you know, per, I don't know that we organizationally we've never taken like an official stance on it. Our position is that, you know, state employees and public employees who provide important and critical services just need paid better across the board, right? They need to make living wages um, and have, you know, access um, to health care that is affordable and quality and, 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 you know, that they can use. So that's that's kind of our solution there. Um, I've heard arguments in favor um, and in opposition to locality pay personally. Um, and I, I do I do think both sides make some good points. Um, I know when I was out in the eastern panhandle a couple of times over the summer and fall, um, and I, I, I've known this, but I didn't really know it to the extent um, that, that I did when I talked to folks out there. I didn't realize that, like, a teacher can literally cross the border and almost double their salary. Right. And for, like I didn't, I didn't quite understand it was like the it was that stark out there. I think they call it a thousand dollars a mile. I think is uh, is, the, yeah. is the term they use for it there. Matt Harvey, you mentioned the regional jail issues. Um, is was there thirteen? Am I? I was I was told that there was thirteen deaths in the Southern Regional Jail in one year. Do you, Do you have any information on that? I, I can't quote an exact number, but I I have been told that it is. Um, I have been I have been told that on a per capita basis we have one of the worst problems in the country when it comes to deaths in our regional jails. There's uh, a I can't, I can't I can't quote numbers right off the top of my head on that one. Matt. Okay, I that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. It's probably not a an area that you get asked about a lot. But but if we're talking about locality pay and we have a 75 percent vacancy in at the at the eastern regional jail. Um, is is that strong enough message to the rest of the state that we have s- serious issues with staffing and and providing basic, you know, required services to our citizens? I, I mean, I would hope so. I mean, I would hope that you know the um, you know the staffing shortages um, you see across state agencies uh, would be enough to to get the attention of decision makers here in Charleston that really um, taking away from your base budget right through tax cuts. It, 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 it is never going to fix this problem, right? When you talk about competitive salaries um, so we can attract the best and the brightest um, to do the necessary work 
the critically important work that the public sector does, um, that requires investment in your base budget, right? Like you have to you have to build and you have to be able to grow. What they're talking about now, right now is taking away permanently um, the ability to do that, and that, that that's going to have serious repercussions. You, we're not going to fix these problems um, if we take away um, from from the state general revenue. Like we have to build, we have to acknowledge that West Virginia has to grow from within. Does does your group have a plan or a suggestion to how to attract growth in the state of West Virginia? Seth says tax cuts know. attract people. Yeah, I I don't think they do. Um, I think that all all evidence, um, you know, says I think pretty clearly that that nobody chooses to live somewhere based on the tax cut, right? Um, you know, if, you know, the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy, um, since our founding, I think more than 15 years ago, has always advocated that really the, the first step in building the better West Virginia that we want um, is, to, is to build from within, right? Um, it, you know, drives me personally crazy and, and everyone I work with crazy when we talk about how we have to beg businesses to come here, right? The solution to West Virginia's problems, by God, if we can just get people who aren't from West Virginia to come to West Virginia, then then everything will be okay. We think that's the wrong way of looking at it. You know, we think investing in things like um, a higher minimum wage um, and investing in, um, you know, affordable health care uh, that, that can, you know, get people back on the job and keep them healthy. Like, you know, investing in our people here is the way to go. Seth DiStefano is our guest here on the program from the West Virginia Center for Budget and Policy. Seth, I, I guess if, if you were inclined to do so, you could make the case that there's never a time for tax cuts because there's never really a time when things are perfect. There's always a time when something needs addressed, a road, an agency, a whatever. But with that line of thinking, we could ultimately just move to what do you make, give it to me, form of government, and then we'll just take care of you at that point. And I don't think that's what anybody wants. Well, I shouldn't say anybody. I don't think that's what most well, people want. At some point along the way, you're tapped out on how much you can pay the government with taxes because of what you need to bring home. And in a high cost of area like here, the Eastern Panhandle, is, uh, we benefit from our proximity to Washington, D.C., but we also pay the price for it, too, because things cost more here. It costs more to buy a house here. There's only so much you can net out from a paycheck before people can't live any longer. Well, and I tell you what, we're not, you know, we're not advocating for all of your paycheck goes to the government. I mean, that, that's, that's never been what we're talking about. The important thing for people to ask themselves, when you hear, you know, the governor or you hear a handful of lawmakers in Charleston talk about tax cuts, you know, Rob, Matt, everyone out there listening, the first question you need to demand an answer to is tax cuts for who? Right. And so we're not opposed um, to a more equitable tax structure, we just think that middle and lower income folks need to help more, right? It, the, the wealthiest 20% of West Virginians um, have, you know, in, you know, privileges and and a better life just in, inherently um, than the 80% um, who exist underneath them. Well, what's that? Feel that that 80. What's that income cutoff? What's what's the top 20%? Uh, you make how much money before you're in the top 20%? I believe it's right around 148, 149 grand. So 20 percent um, of population me, of West Virginia has a household income of better than 148 thousand. Let me double check that real quick. I've got that seems high in a poor my, state. My, my one pager right here. So starting at 109 thousand, excuse me. So the wealthiest, the wealthiest one fifth of households in West Virginia makes 109 thousand dollars and higher. So are you advocating a, a tax cut for those who make one ten or less? Is that basically what you're saying? Or, or you're not advocating that, you know, there, there's, there's, there are tax policies like the earned income tax credit um, or refundable child tax credit, um, you know, really zeroing in on families that have kids um, are, are policies we have always supported. Literally right now, um, we could, um, with this temporary money that we have, remember, a lot of this surplus is severance tax. It's, you know, it's based off of factors that just aren't going to be around much longer. Um, but while we do have the money, one of the things we have floated down here with lawmakers is say, hey, you know, send every family um, who has children under 17 and under $1,000 a kid. Just send it to them. You know, 
that that's the kind of that's the kind of stuff that really helps families, um, and and a lot more um, you know across the um, um, you know economic spectrum than than what's being discussed right now. Any final questions for Seth Zephano? Seth, uh, on a on a personal level, I know that you were displaced by a fire recently. Um, have you, have you been able to get back into your your apartment? Um, I found a new place. Yeah, um, I, I literally um, picked up the keys yesterday. So, oh, nice. Um, yeah, I'm on. You know, the beat goes on. I'm alive. <laughs> um, a you know well properly funded and resourced fire department. Um, evacuated not just me, uh, but a lot of other people from the building. I say that, not, no, no, I, I mean that, right? This, that taxes matter, right? Uh-huh. Um, without a without a well-resourced, well-trained Charleston Fire Department, things could have looked a lot different because, um, and just, you know, I think I've talked to Rob and, and company about this before, the fire alarm didn't go off um, in, in the building. So um, the fire department didn't get the call until the smoke was, like, pouring out of the building. Yikes. Um, so they really had to they really had to mobilize and act quickly, and they did. Um, and uh, a, a lot of thanks to them for that. Seth, thanks uh, so much for your time this morning. As always, much appreciated, sir. All right, um, we will maybe we, let's catch up after after this all this hoopla um, calms down. We'll, I, we'll do a post mortem. I'm available at your convenience, sir. All right, talk to you all later. Always take care of my fellow Pazans.